From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. If you've met a Jehovah's Witness, it's probably because one of them knocked on your door and wanted to share some Bible literature with you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations. All around the world, eight million witnesses do this kind of public ministry. They call it field service. With those words, Jesus commissioned his followers to share the good news about the kingdom of God. They also make videos like the one you're listening to now. Jehovah's Witnesses were one of the first religious groups to use media to spread their primary message, which is this. The world is ending soon. Armageddon is coming. But join us and you'll live forever in an earthly paradise. That's the message. That is why we shall not fear. Though the earth undergo change, do you think God can be our refuge? It has become the greatest preaching campaign the world has ever known. I've been going door to door. I was going door to door from a really young age. Candace Conti grew up in the Jehovah's Witness community in Fremont, California. As a child, she spent 70 hours a month doing public ministry door to door. She carried Bible pamphlets that painted a picture of heaven on earth. People from all nationalities coming together, animals grazing in technicolor fields, gardens overflowing with food. As a kid, I just remember my my whole opening spiel was, wouldn't you love to live in a beautiful place like this? There would be no sickness. There would be no death. Your loved ones that have passed away would be brought back to life. When people responded to this vision, when they let Candace inside to talk some more, it felt great. There's nothing like it, actually. You know, you're taught that you're saving this person's life. I mean, I wanted to be the best Jehovah's Witness that I could be. But the organization became a dark place for Candace, a place that she now looks at with anger and sadness. Just a note here that this story covers some difficult material related to sexual abuse. When Candace was in grade school, she went on field service calls with a man named Jonathan Kendrick. He was very dominating. He, he commanded a, a presence. Um, to me, he's just big, you know? When they were alone, Candace says, Kendrick would take her to his house and molest her. Kendrick denies his claim and was never prosecuted for it, but a jury in a civil lawsuit found wrongdoing. Candace blames the policies of the Jehovah's Witnesses for failing to protect her from abuse. And across the country, lawsuits against the organization are mounting. But the witnesses are fighting these claims in court. They argue their child sex abuse policies should be protected by the First Amendment. To them, it's a matter of religious freedom. Reveal reporter Trey Bundy and producer Delaney Hall tell the story. Ten months ago, a package arrived at the Center for Investigative Reporting. It was a plain manila envelope. Trey Bundy opened it with his editor. It was a stack of documents, and one of the first things we saw was confidential. A man with ties to the Jehovah's Witnesses had sent the package. The envelope was filled with documents from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the global headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses in New York. That's where the organization's governing body lives and works. They are the spiritual leaders of the organization. They're the equivalent of the Pope in the Catholic Church. And they set policy for the organization. They call it shedding new light. The Watchtower distributes the policy through memos sent to elders at congregations across the country. The memos are for the elders' eyes only. They're not supposed to be shared outside the organization. Okay, here we go. Trey started reading through the documents. So from Ecclesiastes 3.7, they say there's a time to keep quiet when your words should prove to be few. The language is this mix of corporate policy and Bible verse. I will set a muzzle as a guard to my own mouth as long as anyone wicked is in front of me. The memos described how congregation elders should handle allegations of child sex abuse. Improper use of the tongue by an elder can result in serious legal problems for the individual, the congregation, and even the society. And by that, they mean the Watchtower Society. And boiled down, here's what the memos said. Keep your mouth shut. Do not go to law enforcement. Erwin Zalkin is a lawyer in San Diego. He has more than a dozen sex abuse lawsuits pending against the Watchtower. He's studied these memos and deposed leaders in the organization. He says the policy on sex abuse is clear. You come to us first. Don't you tell anybody. You don't warn parents in the congregation. We'll decide what happens here. That's their policy. 
which is in line with the organization's general mistrust of the outside world. They live in a very, very closed community. They look at the rest of the world as being diseased, as being controlled by Satan. So essentially, they're told not to mix with the rest of the world any more than they have to. Trey spent the next nine months learning about this closed community. He discovered the Watchtower has worked with local congregations to hide sex abuse from law enforcement. The organization's policies, wrapped in biblical language, have allowed perpetrators to skirt the law and, in some cases, to abuse multiple victims. Chapter 5 Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And they are fornication, uncleanness, loose conduct, and things like these. That those who practice such things will not inherit God's kingdom. Candace Conti has experienced the effects of the Watchtower's policies firsthand. She says that after Jonathan Kendrick molested her, she didn't tell anyone about it. She kept attending meetings at her North Fremont congregation. The elders there had known her pretty much all her life. In particular, Larry Lambert and Michael Clark, Abrahamson, they all watched me grow up. You know what I mean? It is that tight-knit of a community. I mean, there really is no outside. This is your association. What Candace did not know was that at least two of those elders were already aware that Kendrick had a history of abuse. Just a year before, he told them that he'd sexually molested his 13-year-old stepdaughter. Here's Trey again. When the elders in Fremont discovered that Kendrick had abused his stepdaughter, they notified the Watchtower in writing. A couple of weeks later, the Watchtower sent a letter back to North Fremont saying that what Kendrick did was considered uncleanness. Uncleanness is a term from the Bible, and it's considered a minor offense. Because of that, the sanctions against him wouldn't be as harsh. Good morning. This marks the beginning of videotape number one in the deposition of Michael Clark. Years later, in a legal deposition, a Fremont elder named Michael Clark acknowledged that, yes, they'd known that Kendrick had abused multiple victims. Did you notify law enforcement of the information that you had received about the touching of these two girls by Mr. Kendrick? No. Why not? Our legal department um, advised me... At this point, Jehovah's Witness lawyer James McCabe jumps in. I'm going to object. I'm going to ask you not to say what they advised you, but you can just say that you contact the legal department and you acted accordingly. I'll join in that objection. Clark yeah, also said that the Fremont elders didn't inform the congregation about Kendrick's abuse. We don't make that public to the congregation. That's confidential. It, and, and that's the, the policy and the practice of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that you learned as an elder, correct? Yes. So parents in the congregation, including Candace's parents, weren't notified that Kendrick was a child abuser. Kendrick separated from his wife, and when he moved to a new congregation in Oakley, a town about an hour north, they weren't notified either. Chapter 5 Therefore, to the older men among you, I give this exhortation. Shepherd the flock of God in your care, not under compulsion, but willingly, neither for love of dishonest gain, but eagerly. Okay, well, you're looking at a very nice stuccoed building with tile roof. Um, it's very clean, very simple lines. This is Roger Bentley. He served as an elder in Oakley for almost three decades. In fact, he helped build the Kingdom Hall here. That's what witnesses call the places where they worship. The dimensions of the main auditorium is 44 feet by 88, if I remember correctly. <laughs> we did the foundation, and I can still see those numbers in my head. Bentley says he loved being an elder until he was kicked out for speaking up about child abuse. He took his job seriously. He called himself a shepherd of the flock, God's co-worker. And it was his job to welcome new members, like Jonathan Kendrick. Not long after Kendrick arrived, Bentley and the other Oakley elders got in touch with his old congregation in Fremont. They asked the elders there to send a letter of introduction. Okay, the whole, the whole letter. Dear brothers, enclosed are the publisher cards of Brother Jonathan Kendrick. This kind of letter was pretty standard for a Jehovah's Witness transferring from one town to another. 
The letter mentioned that Kendrick had had a rocky marriage, but for the most part, it was positive. The skills of Brother Kendrick vary from violin playing and topiary to woodworking and welding. He is a very interesting individual who has taken the lead in some, with some young ones in the congregation and helped them from veering off course. The letter didn't mention Jonathan child no abuse. In fact, it implied that he was good with kids. You know, looking back now what I know, this is crazy. The Fremont elders claim they followed up with a second letter that did explain Kendrick's past abuses. But Trey and I have looked at that letter. The letter says right here that his only punishment was for loss of temper and self-control. So Kendrick began to settle in. He met and eventually married a woman in the congregation named Linda Hood. Roger officiated. We thought we went through all the hoops and letter of the law and all that kind of thing. And so we thought that everything was fine. But it wasn't. Mr. Kendrick, can you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Jonathan Kendrick. A few years after they got married, Kendrick sexually molested Linda's granddaughter, Beth. That's not her real name, by the way. We don't reveal the identities of child sex abuse victims if they want to remain anonymous. Kendrick admitted to it and eventually served less than a year in jail. This is from a legal deposition in 2012. When did you sexually touch her granddaughter, January, late January or February, when she was six. Kendrick has never admitted to abusing Candace, but in this same deposition, he did confess to molesting his stepdaughter from his previous marriage back in Fremont. And he talked about how the elders there responded. Did any of these elders ever instruct you to stay away from children alone? Yes. Both of the elders or just one of them? I can specifically remember Gary Abrahamson as he was with Brother Clark. I consider it from both of them. Okay. What did Brother Abramson say in this regard? He said to, to not be alone with children, not allow myself to get in a position where claims could be made against me. Beth, Linda's granddaughter, is 20 now. She doesn't get why the Fremont elders didn't notify Oakley about Kendrick's past. Not in the letter of introduction, not in the follow-up letter. Maybe Kendrick wouldn't have abused her if they'd known. Yeah, I don't understand why if they had to watch him so much that they would not let the other congregation know to do the same. They'd protect their own people, but not the next congregation's people. Chapter 10. Proverbs of Solomon. In the abundance of words, there does not fail to be transgression. But the one keeping his lips in check is acting discreetly. By now, you've probably noticed that there's a lot of paperwork in this story. Trey has sorted through thousands of pages. So these folders are full of letters from the Watchtower to congregations, from congregations to the Watchtower, uh, court depositions with Watchtower officials. That's because the Watchtower requires strict communication with congregation elders. Here's Erwin Zalkin again, the lawyer who's currently trying more than a dozen sex abuse cases against the Watchtower. They are directed by the Watchtower, they're controlled by the Watchtower, they answer to the Watchtower. Everything goes to the Watchtower. And that includes information very relevant to this story. Almost two decades ago, the Watchtower sent out a letter. To every elder in the entire United States and said, we want you to give us all your information on anyone that's a uh, known child sex abuser in your congregation. They required congregations to answer specific questions related to the nature of the abuse, the name of the offender, and when it happened. So Zalkin figured. There must be a database for this. They, they didn't just do this for the fun of it. Zalkin subpoenaed the Watchtower to turn over that database when he was arguing another case, but they refused. They said their data on child abusers is mixed up in millions of other documents. It would take too long to search them. We have 14, over 14,400 congregations, and that continues to grow. Richard Ash works for the Watchtower. His department oversees correspondence between the Watchtower and local congregations. This is from a deposition last year. So you would be going through approximately 3 million documents that are contained in 14,400 files. 
Here's Zalkin again. When they go to the extreme of arguing that the information that they have on the numbers of abusers in their, within their organization is so overwhelming for them to put together, it would suggest that there is a substantial problem that they are clearly aware of and don't want to reveal. When the Watchtower wouldn't hand over the information, the judge in that case struck the organization's defense and awarded a $13.5 million default judgment to Zalkin's client. Zalkin says the Watchtower's refusal is a good example of their general stance towards the secular court system. They see themselves as uh, answering to a higher authority, so they're not going to change anything to accommodate what we consider reasonable standards of care. Chapter 13. Let every soul be in subjection to the superior authorities. For there is no authority except by God. The existing authorities stand placed in their relative positions by God. Seven years after Jonathan Kendrick molested Beth in Oakley, Candace Conti learned about the abuse. I had this sense of guilt. You know, what if I did something? What if I hadn't been such a coward? What if I had done something to maybe protect this other child, you know? So Candace decided to bring a civil lawsuit against Kendrick, the North Fremont Congregation, and the Watchtower. In 2012, a jury found that the organization was negligent, having known that Kendrick was dangerous. They awarded Candace more than $15 million in damages to be paid by Kendrick, North Fremont, and the Watchtower. The Watchtower and the North Fremont Congregation are currently appealing. May it please the court, James McCabe on behalf of the North Fremont Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. I have two points. About a month ago, we attended the appeal hearing and listened in on the Watchtower's arguments. Witness lawyers referenced the First Amendment and the constitutional right to religious freedom. The religious beliefs and standards of Jehovah's Witnesses were at play in this case from start to finish. Namely, in the Watchtower letters that outline sex abuse policy. And the elders are counseled in that letter to give special heed to the counsel to not reveal the confidential talk of another. Quoting from the Bible book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 9. Because those policy letters reference Deuteronomy, Ecclesiastes, the Psalms, Proverbs, witness lawyers argue that their First Amendment right of religious freedom protects them from scrutiny. But Zalkin isn't buying that. That's not the law. The law is that, you know, we can't question what you believe, believe what you want to believe, but we can question your conduct. For months, Trey has been sending emails and making phone calls, trying to get in touch with local elders and the Watchtower's governing body. He wants to know why the organization hasn't released their information on known child abusers. Hi, can you please connect me with Extension? He called Garrett Loesch, the longest serving member of the governing body. Hi, Extension 4. And Richard Ash, the Watchtower supervisor who you heard in an earlier deposition. And Alan Schuster, a Watchtower administrator. No response. Trey traveled to Watchtower headquarters in New York, but no one would talk. Which gets back to the issue at the heart of this story. Secrecy. Then, just before our broadcast, we received this written statement from the Watchtower. It says, Jehovah's Witnesses abhor child abuse. Then it says, congregation elders comply with child abuse reporting laws and that they're committed to doing all they can to prevent child abuse. But as the Watchtower faces a growing number of sex abuse lawsuits across the country, they're doubling down on their policies. Their most recent memo about how to handle crimes came out just a few months ago. Again, it discourages elders from reporting to police and advises them to rely on internal judicial committees instead. And then it lists the types of crimes they're talking about. Murder, rape, child abuse, fraud, theft, and assault. They're essentially strengthening their original position. We're not going to cooperate. We're not going to talk. But slowly, lawsuit by lawsuit, the Watchtower's policies are being exposed. People like Candace aren't keeping quiet anymore. I wasn't going to take the back seat. I wanted to go full full steam ahead and expose them for what they really were, and the, the policies and the procedures for what they really were. For Reveal, I'm Delaney Hall. And I'm Trey Bundy. 
In 2012, Beth, Kendrick's stepdaughter, brought a lawsuit against the Watchtower, but it was dismissed on First Amendment grounds. Linda Hood remains married to Jonathan Kendrick, who still attends the Oakley Kingdom Hall. Judges will rule on the Watchtower's appeal in the Candace Conti case this spring. To read the Watchtower's full statement and find out more about the story, visit our website at revealnews.org.